Welcome to ATCM, the emergency medicine channel. Sir, shall we? Yes. Eighty-seven-year-old male, no case of type two diabetes, hypertension, CVA, presented to the ER with acute onset breathlessness. In our initial ten-second assessment, the patient was conscious and oriented. Coming to the primary survey, airway was patent, air and rib bilaterally equal, no pooling of saliva, no increase in secretions. Coming to the breathing part, the respiratory rate was 26 per minute, saturation of 86 percentage in room air. Uh, we also noticed that the patient was using accessory muscles for respiration. So we keep the patient in propped up position and started on three liter of O2 via nasal prongs. Hmm. Coming to circulation, the heart rate was 136 beats per minute, BP of 140 by 90. Two large bore IV cannulas were inserted during this point. Coming to disability, the GCS was 15 by 15, pupil bilaterally equally reacting to light. Coming to exposure, it was normal body temperature and blood sugar level was 240 milligram per deciliter. So, can we just do the breakdown of what we have said? So, what is the age of the patient? 87 years. 87 year old male who has come with acute onset of breathlessness. Since when? Uh, Oh, half an hour and half an hour back half an hour so somebody is coming to you 87 year old male acute onset breathlessness so uh, on arrival he was tachypneic and he was hypoxic okay. so he started him on oxygen okay. so uh, why you start on 3 liters oxygen just 3 liters oxygen initially see initial dictum best thing will be you start him on a higher flow of nasal oxygen okay so okay. just starting on a mid later on you can taper down maybe you can put like 5 to 10 liters in between something like a face mask or if we significantly hypoxic you put him on an nrbm non rebreathing mask so that maximum oxygen delivery will happen and after that you taper down the oxygen okay and otherwise if the patient is having breathlessness and uh, what was the uh, chest, chest finding crepitations yes bilateral bilateral crepitation was there so uh, what will be the ideal thing for him to be started now uh, bipap sir non invasive ventilation yes. so if there is no contraindication for non invasive ventilation ideally this patient will benefit from a non invasive ventilation <laughs> You have a patient coming with sudden onset of bilateral breathlessness with bilateral crepitations with hypoxia. It is like unless I'm told, it is an acute pulmonary edema. It is very straightforward thing. Sudden onset. You can otherwise call it as a flash pulmonary edema. Suddenly it has developed. Suddenly some acute event has happened and he has developed a flash pulmonary edema. So that is one of the differential diagnoses that we need to consider. So you started him on oxygen. What was the blood pressure? 149. 140 by 90. 140 by 90. What do you need to do in Anything at this point of time? No, no, nothing else to be done. Maybe uh, if, if the blood pressure is again going up, maybe you need to put him on a nitroglycerin infusion. So that will be an ideal choice for this patient. Okay, then continue your assessment. Yes, uh, adjuncts to the primary survey. What are the what are the adjuncts that is needed to the primary survey uh, here? Uh, we can take an ABG. We can take blood gas. Okay. So what was the blood gas finding? Uh, it showed metabolic acidosis. Sir. Metabolic acidosis. So sudden onset of breathlessness with metabolic acidosis. What is the type of metabolic acidosis? High anion gap metabolic uh, acidosis. Normal, normal anion gap. Sir. So what was the anion gap? Tell me. Anion gap was seven, sir. Seven. Yeah. So why he should develop a normal anion gap metabolic acidosis? What should be the reason behind a normal anion gap metabolic acidosis? What was the lactate level? Uh, lactate level was normal, sir. Two point four. Two point four. PCO2, PCO2 was uh, 43 sir. 43. What is the expected PCO2 for the bicarbonate? Uh, it was. Uh, What is the bicarbonate for this patient? Uh, bicarbonate was uh, 15 sir. 15. So what is the expected bicarbonate? Uh, for every. Uh, you can use the Windows formula. 15 into 1.5. So it will be somewhere around 35. 35. So 35 it is coming up. So the patient is having 43. So what does that mean? The patient is also having a respiratory, respiratory acidosis. acidosis. The patient is having a metabolic acidosis oh. as well as respiratory yeah, acidosis. Yeah. Reason for metabolic acidosis? Why? Yeah. Renal failure? No, creatinine? No, so creatinine was normal. Normal. What else is the common cause for uh, metabolic acidosis? Lactate? Lactate normal. normal. Then 
any poison unlikely because sudden onset of breathlessness so this was also normal it was also normal so diabetic ketosis so normal anal gap metabolic acidosis what will be the one of the most reason why he should develop this so he might be going for a high anal gap maybe the values has been wrong we don't know because it's a blood gas value sometimes the sodium potassium can be wrong in the blood gas value so we cannot trust it 100 percentage so classically we are expecting an uh, high anal gap metabolic acidosis but he is having a normal anal gap metabolic along with respiratory acidosis why respiratory acidosis is going for an impending respiratory failure so if you are not tackling that respiratory issue he is going for an impending respiratory failure then what is the other adjuncts that you need to do uh, ECG was taken sir. ECG was taken what did it show uh, it show ST elevation AVR sir and uh, respiratory changes in uh, high lateral rate sir Yeah, the reciprocal changes in the lateral leads and AVR it showed ST segment elevation. So, what does an AVR ST segment elevation implicate? So, I think it implicates that uh, there is an uh, ST elevation in my most probably uh, the main coronary artery is up. So, the left main coronary artery or a very proximal LAD is occluded. So, that is what it is showing. LMCA occlusion. AVR ST elevation classically shows either it is a left main coronary artery occlusion or else this patient is having a very proximal LAD occlusion. That will be the two possibilities by which we have to see. So, we have to take it like an ST elevation MI. So, this patient is having an ST elevation MI. Now, we have to say whenever you say my... Uh, myocardial infarction ST elevation MI we are considering that it is an LMCA occlusion probably an LMCA or a proximal LAD occlusion then the next thing is that whether he is in failure or not yes, the he is in cardiac failure so then the next thing is what is his rhythm what is his rhythm his yeah, normal, normal sinus rhythm sinus rhythm normal sinus rhythm but sinus tachycardia was there so rhythm was normal but sinus tachycardia was there so he is having any other complication other rather than pulmonary what are the other complications of mi so it can be uh, any arrhythmias arrhythmias can be there so arrhythmias is not there then what are the other complications that you can think any of failure papillary left ventricular failure already he is having okay. then papillary muscle necrosis so he can have an acute mr then what else he can have ventricular septal rupture so that is the other complication that he can have and very late complication he can have a ventricular aneurysm so when will you suspect a ventricular aneurysm persistent. not for this patient persistent st elevation so ideally what will happen to the st either you go for a treatment or it will form a q wave so if you give adequate treatment the st will subside or else the patient will go for an q waves but if the st elevation is persistently elevated after one week also the st is elevated you have to think in terms of an ventricular aneurysm so that is a persistent st elevation that is one of the differential diagnosis okay so we have an avr st segment elevation and what do you mean by kilips classification you know kilips classification yes sir yeah so what category he will come into he comes into kilips type 3 sir type 3 so can you tell what is kilips 1 2 3 and 4 Uh, so in Kilips type one, hmm. there are no features of any heart failure. Okay. So when you auscultate, the patient is having myocardial infarction, acute ST elevation MI. But when you are auscultating, there is no crepitation. So that is K A L L I P S. Kilips one, Kilips two. You can get S three and trials. Okay. Or you can have basal crepitations. Kilips three. is acute pulmonary edema it is a acute pulmonary edema maybe you, it's all around the uh, chest there is crepitation and kilips for this patient is having cardiogenic associated shock. cardiogenic shock so probably this patient is going for a kilips 3 so kilips 1 you maybe you can get minimally minimal crepts but there is no other a major evidence of failure kilips 2 it is that half of the lung field so you can say that half of the lung field when you auscultate half of the lung field you are able to get crepitation and kilips 3 complete lung field wherever you auscultate you are getting uh, crepitation and kilips 3 it is kilips 3 plus associated hypotension we can call it as kilips 4 classification so kilip 1 kilip 2 kilip 3 and kilip 4 so kilip 3 that means that this patient is having acute pulmonary edema that is affecting the entire lungs when you auscultate entire part of the lungs you are able to see the auscultation so what does it show it shows the mortality so again this scoring you can predict what is the mortality so if the as the kilip score increases the mortality rate increases obviously the involvement is more involvement is uh, mortality is going to be high so that is what we will be able to see from the kilips now what you have done you have a come patient with chest pain an elderly gentleman has come with a chest pain and uh, you have done a hypoxia was there you have started him on oxygen 
and next thing is that what uh, you have put him on NIV or just oxygen only? No, sir. Uh, after we reassess the patient was still tachypneic. So, so you put it the patient on, on the NIV. So after reassessment, you put back the patient on NIV. You took an ECG and you confirmed a diagnosis of an ST elevation MI involving the AVR. So AVR, there was an ST elevation. So can you just tell me briefly regarding ECG findings and coronary territories? Work could be the possible lesion. We are only doing a guesswork. Angiogram only can let us know completely what exactly is happening. So V1, V2, usually it is a septum. So septum, which, which is a blood vessel that is applying left anterior descending. So if you are seeing a V1, V2, ST second elevation, we are suggesting most probably the lesion is in the proximal, somewhere in the LAD. Then V3, V4, again it is the anterior wall. So again the lesion is in the LAD. V5, V6, where could be the lesion? It can be in the distal LAD or it can be the left circumflex or sometimes some patient will have right circumflex also. Very, very minimal group of patient only. So any of these vessels will be involved when you are having a lateral wall MI. Coming to the inferior wall MI which is the most common right coronary artery. So, inferior wall MI, it can be either right coronary or it can be lesion in the RCX or in the LCX. So, depending upon the ST elevation in the ECG, you can guess what could be the, where could be the, which could be the culprit vessel, where is the occlusion that has happened to this patient. So, we have to go back and review the angiogram report of this patient. So, have you done that for this patient? Know, sir. You have to do that. You have to go back and review the angiogram and whether you have to see whether it is an LMC occlusion or it was a proximal LAD, very high LAD occlusion. So, by this we will be able to know that where will be the culprit vessel, which will be the culprit vessel. So, right now we have confirmed a diagnosis of an ST elevation MI. So, we will put diagnosis like this now. Coronary artery disease, yes. Yes, sir. ST elevation of my yes. yes Where ST elevation? It is probably involving the mm -hmm. high anterior wall, or it can complete proximal LAD, mm -hmm. or it can be an high uh, LMC occlusion. Then sinus rhythm. Phillips three and in sinus rhythm. rhythm. So that is how our diagnosis will come for this patient. Now, what all things you need to do? You need to think of giving him antiplatelets, pain management and hypertension management if any. So can you elaborate what all the treatment that you had given to him? Uh, so the patient was having sinus tachycardia. Uh, so he uh, wanted the heart rate to be below 90 mm -hmm. since uh, higher heart rate can compromise the diastolic. Okay, fine. Uh, so we have given uh, injection method Prolol uh, 5mg IV stat was given. Okay. And that reduces the heart rate. Okay, so you did that. Okay, fine. Then. Uh, then we have given the loading dose, uh, aspirin 325mg, crushed tablets were given. Okay. Uh, tab ticagrelor uh, 180mg was given. Okay. And tab atovastatin 80mg was also given stat. Okay. So these are the stat medication that you need to give. If you don't have ticagrelor, you can still go with clopidogrel. But 300 to 600mg, you can go for clopidogrel also. But now the preferences for a, when you are planning for a PCA, the preferred drug regimen is ticagrelor. Okay. okay. Prasugrel was there, uh, it is still there, but uh, the bleeding risk is little bit high as compared to the other drugs. So, these are the options, aspirin 100% or second antiplatelet, either you can choose clopidogrel, prasugrel or ticagrelor. Uh -huh. Ticagrelor has got a superiority as compared to the other things now. Okay, then statins, high dose of statins also we need to give. Then. You have given him a metoprolol. Pain management, whether he had any pain? No, sir. No he is a diabetic? Yes, sir. He was a diabetic. So, that is a classical thing. So, otherwise, you would have think of giving a pain management also. So, which all patients you need oxygen? That is a classical thing that for MI you give oxygen. That was a normal teaching that we learned when our undergraduate days. So, is that really needed? Or which all group of patients you need to give oxygen? Uh, sir, oxygen is needed. We need to just maintain a saturation of 92 percentage if no the uh, 95 above if it is maintained no need of oxygen okay. if it is 95 and below only you start him on oxygen so that is clear if it is 95 and above don't start oxygen if it is below that you start him on oxygen so otherwise excess oxygen itself will cause free radical injury so there are n number of studies that is proven that you doesn't need to give uh, more oxygen for a patient so only thing if there is hypoxia as evident by a saturation of less than 95 percentage you give oxygen otherwise you don't give oxygen for a patient with myocardial infarction so now we have done what you have done you have secured the airway breathing you have done circulation right now okay heart rate you have bring down by giving you a metaprolol you have given your loading doses you have given your uh, uh, anti uh, this thing also anti-cholesterol medications also now what what should be your plan 
so the time is gold in the case of uh, myocardial infarction okay uh, so if the patient presents uh, within the door uh, door to the immediate time is less than 120 minutes we will take up the patient for pca if you have a facility to do a door to dental time within less than 120 minute and you have got the facility in your center or there is they are referring to a center where the patient can reach to a cath lab and door to dental time you can maintain less than 120 minutes you have to send him for a pca facility if you don't have a percutaneous coronary in the prime coronary intervention facility then you can still consider doing a thrombolysis but as you know as the cardiogenic shock and failure rate is more in this patient he will be an ideal candidate for a pca rather than for a thrombolysis this patient is having always already is in the verge of going to a clips four so this candidate is a higher risk for going for an thrombolysis therapy so he will be an ideal candidate for a pca Uh, where uh, you can go ahead and do the angioplasty and uh, straight away you can look into the vessel and uh, add on like a GP23BA inhibitors in Apix that all these drugs can you ju- just name some GP23BA inhibitors Triofibam hmm. Defibrated. Okay, so these are the indicators. So routinely, we need not start these drugs in the ED. When the patient is going to the cath lab, only that is needed. Routinely, ED medications, this loading doses, heparin. Again, if your uh, patient is going for a thrombolysis therapy or PCA, heparin. Again, we can hold for the time being. No need to give from the ED. But non-stimulation, may obviously we need to give heparin also. So these are the basic regimens that you need to give for. What what we have done all those things. What has happened to this patient? the patient was taken for pca so. pca so we have to follow up this patient yes. and see what was the culprit vessel where was exactly the culprit vessel so we will have some ecg correlation whether our assumption was right or wrong we will come to know so we have to check that so uh, what will be the expected suppose this patient goes for a hypotension what will you do 140 he gone into a clips 4 classification what will you do at that point of time me please i am telling you is 80 by 40 Uh, sir, we will start on IV fluids. Eighty by forty. Clips four is already in complete already ma. The heart has failed already, and it has gone to cardiogenic shock. Inotropes. You have to not start on inotrop initially. You need to start on an agent. What inotrop? You will tell me one example of an inotrop. Uh, not an inotrop. Uh, not an inotrop. It is a vasopressor. Inotrop is an agent which will increase the contractility of the heart noradrenaline primarily has got an alpha action so it is basically primarily acting on the blood vessel peripheral blood vessel causing vasoconstriction ideally when you call it as an inotropic agent will be a dobutamine which will increase the contractility of the heart or else he will go cementan these are the drugs that you can mill renon enamrenon these are the ideal when you ask for an ideal example for inotrop these are the examples for that dopamine depending upon the dose If you are starting an alpha dose, it will not have any inotropic effect. If you have to start for an inotropic effect, you have to start on that dose. So ideal agent will be dobutamine, but the problem with dobutamine again is what it will cause vasodilatation. And when you start for a patient with AD by 40 BP, and suddenly the heart rate increases and the contractility also increases, but there is vasodilatation. So suddenly there is pooling of blood in the periphery. As a result, there is decrease in venous return. So what will happen? There will be further worsening of the hypotension. So what you have to do? If the patient is in shock and the patient is in hypotension, what you have to put a noradrenaline and you increase the blood pressure above a systolic range of above 90 or 100. Then you add on a dobutamine. Otherwise, what will happen? The BP will suddenly crash. Okay, you have to have this idea. So, where you, you said regarding IV fluids, which MI you will give IV fluids? RV. Right ventricular infarction, you will give uh, IV fluids. How will you confirm right ventricular infarction? Right side. Right side leads. First, you take an ECG. You are seeing that it's an inferior wall MI. So, when you see an inferior wall MI, you take a right side ECG and you take and and see what is happening in the AVR. So not AVR, right V4. That means what is right side of ECG? V1, V2, you have connected. Okay, so V1, V2 is here. V3, V4, V5, V6 is here. So we are just taking V3, V4, V5, V6, and you are placing it on the right side of the chest, same area where we keep it on the left side. Instead of left, we are keeping it on the right side, and you are looking for V4. R R means right side, and you are looking for any ST elevation in V4 R. 
if there is any st elevation in v4r you can confirm that this patient is having a right ventricular infarction all inferior wall mi is not right ventricular mi it can be an lv mi also it is not a right ventricular mi if there is st elevation in v4r then only we can call it as an right ventricular mi so if it is an rv mi then you can give IV fluids and again nitroglycerin is contraindicated. Because again nitroglycerin, if you give what will happen, again venous return will decrease. So again RV filling will come down. So hypotension will worsen. So this group of patients, you should not give nitroglycerin. Okay. So inferior MI, you take a right sided ECG. V4R, if there is an ST segment elevation, you can think, tell that this patient is having an RV infarction or there are other criteria lead ST elevation in lead 3 more than lead 2 that is again a criteria when you take a normal ECG that is normal left sided ECG and you look at the ECG and lead 3 is more than lead 2 ST elevation in lead 3 is more than in lead 2 that is one clue that the probably this patient is having an RVMI otherwise the best thing will be to take a right sided ECG okay so what will be your take home message this patient never had any chest pain so he just came in with breathlessness but it was acute onset breathlessness an elderly gentleman who came with acute onset of breathlessness and who is a diabetic when you took an ACG the ECG was showing features of ST elevation that you do in AVR and corresponding reciprocal ST segment depression so when you see a V4 uh, v, uh, AVR ST elevation LMC occlusion is one of the most common thing that you need to remember you started him on what, what all things you started him on oxygen because he was hypoxic and you decrease the heart rate by giving a beta blocker but again can you give a beta blocker in a failing heart it is actually when you look at all in that perspective it is contraindicated but why we gave beta blocker it is to decrease the heart rate otherwise the heart failure will worsen further so third thing you have started him on antiplatelet agent beta antiplatelet echo aspirin not echo aspirin aspirin and ticagrelor or else you can add either clopidogrel or prosugrel and statins is mandatory then you need to decide whether this patient go for thrombolysis or whether this patient for primary coronary intervention depending upon your facility what is available if you have facility for pca go ahead with pca otherwise you can start think of doing thrombolysis with either with tpa or if tpa is still not available you can even go with streptokinase what is the difference between streptokinase and tpa what is the advantage of streptokinase and tpa uh, TP is fibrin specific, sir. TP is fibrin specific. There is something called as TMI flow, TIMI flow. That is what is happening is that after you thrombolize the patient, you are looking back the angiogram and seeing how is the flow to the patient. When you compare the flow rate, almost 50 to 60 percentage only patients will have very good TMI flow following a streptokinase. But when you compare it with TPA, it, the flow rate improvement is much better as compared with streptokinase. So TPA is much better drug as compared with uh, streptokinase. But you still you don't have a facility where you don't get streptokinase, uh, TPA. Streptokinase hardly costs you 2000 rupees. TPA for an MI you need to have 75,000 to 1 lakh. So affordability, availability, all those things you need to consider. If you don't have anything, you can still streptokinase holds good to be given. Okay. Anything else to add on? Yes. Okay. Thank you.